Good morning. Um, thank you for joining today's launch of Digital Australia 2022, Connected by Games. Uh, I'm Ron Curry. I'm the CEO of the Interactive Games and Entertainment Association. Uh, we've been doing these DANS releases now for around 16 years, and today is the ninth iteration. So it's D DA22. And it's our belief this is the longest longitudinal study globally for this sort of work. Um, DA22 is pulled together by Bond University under the very watchful eye of Dr. Jeffrey Brand, who's today's presenter. And those who know Jeff know his passion for the industry and his ability to succinctly communicate the story of how games allow us to communicate during COVID. Uh, we'll be having a Q&A at the end, so please stick around after the presentation. And during the presentation, feel free just to uh, drop your questions in the Q&A section rather than the chat, that way we'll be able to tell what they are. And feel free, of course, to use the chat throughout the presentation. So I'd like to say thanks to two people in particular to start with, Senator James McGrath and Tim Zwart MP, the member for Jellybrand, who are both on the opposite side of the political divide, but have come together to sponsor the Parliamentary Friends of Video Games Group. And they've provided some words to kick off the presentation today. So as we begin, I'd like to pass over to our friend David Parkin to more formally open today's presentation with some very important words. Yeah, Hello and welcome to the Digital Australia Research Series 2022. My name is David Parkin. I'm a proud Chiro man from Tabatina country, Tasmania. I'm speaking to you from beautiful Jabwadan country in Western Victoria. What a privilege it is to be asked to open the Digital Australia Research Series DA22 with an acknowledgement to country. But first, I should explain what an acknowledgement to country is. An acknowledgement is a way of acknowledging and paying respect to First Nations people as traditional owners and ongoing custodians of the land. An acknowledgement is made at the start of a meeting, speech, event or formal occasion. An acknowledgement can be made by anyone who is First Nations people or non-Indigenous. This is different to a welcome to country, which is only performed by an elder or a traditional owner from the lands on which you are from. An acknowledgement highlights the unique position of First Nations people in the context of history, culture, and relationships with sea and land. An acknowledgement can be spoken, written, or signed. I encourage you to make an acknowledgement personal and specific to place. A scripted acknowledgement is okay. An acknowledgement in your own voice is more personal. Ask a local group how they would like to be acknowledged. The Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies has a map with local nations and language groups on it. It is a reference that you can use. So if I may, I acknowledge the traditional custodians of country that we are each gathered on today throughout Australia, New Zealand and the rest of the world and the connection to land, sea and community. I pay my respects to elders, past and present and extend that respect to all First Nations people in attendance here today at the Digital Australia Research Series 2022. Did you know that there are around 290 plus Aboriginal languages in Australia? However, no written systems to record any of those spoken words. Message sticks, an ancient form of communication, connection and storytelling. Kane Tara speak stick in my language. Just like how we stay connected for tens of thousands of years, the latest Digital Australia research series explores the theme connected by games and adds to the story of who plays video games, how they played, why they played and attitudes towards video games in Australia. In this iteration you will observe how video games served as a vital source of connection during the pandemic crisis of 2020 and 2021. Features of the research will be explained further. I wish each and everyone attending the Digital Australia Research Series DA22 
finds the research helpful. Thank you very much for your time today. Stay safe and bye for now. As a co-chair of the Parliamentary Friends of Video Games, I'm delighted to help launch this Digital Australia 22 report. This report really shows how the Australian video gaming industry is a mainstream part of Australian life. Like two thirds of Australians, I'm an avid gamer and I wouldn't have gotten through this year's COVID-19 lockdowns without them. At the start of this year, chasing down drops of next generation consoles was a game all in itself. But after I'd secured one, I became one of the 36% of Australians identified in this report who gained more during lockdowns than they did before, and one of the 22% of Australians who used games to communicate with their friends during these lockdowns. I'm one of the 56% of Australians who play video games with their children. Couch co-op on our Nintendo Switch was a lifesaver for my family during the lockdowns. Just Dance became a daily routine for the whole family, a way to get some stress relief, some exercise, and some family bonding all in one hit. And this was one game that my wife and I could play together. Minecraft on the iPad and Ratchet and Clank on the PS5 have been invaluable rewards to keep up my son's motivation for homeschooling. And my daughter has continued to max out her island on Animal Crossing and with a bit of prompting from dad has branched out as an entrepreneur on Stardew Valley. When the kids have gone to bed, I've been grinding on NBA 2K22 since it was released, and I've been keeping in touch with a few other MPs who have been doing the same. Members of Parliament are regular Australians too, I promise. And the reasons that we game look a lot like the top five reasons Australians play video games identified in this report. To have fun, to keep the mind active, to de-stress, to pass time, and to be challenged. I know that from my perspective, I've never needed the escapism of gaming to de-stress more than I have in the last 12 months. Now, as an MP rather than as a gamer, I know that my co-chair, James McGrath, would want me to recognise that the Australian Government has come to the party this year and has recognised the role that game development can play as a high-growth job-creating industry in the post-pandemic world. It's been great to see, not before time, but there's plenty more to do. So I'm really pleased to see the release of the DA22 report to lay the foundation for the future actions that we need to ensure that the Australian video game industry can reach its full potential. G'day, it's Senator James McGrath speaking to you from a very salubrious car park. I just want to thank everybody who's been involved in the Digital Australia 2022 report, and particularly those members of the Interactive Games and Entertainment Association. What your industry does for Australia is so important. And as co-chair of the Parliamentary Friends of Gaming, I can see that firsthand. And as someone who is a self-confessed noob, uh, despite that disqualification or that, that, that handicap, I can see what you and your industry do for Australia. And it is so important that the government, of which I'm a member of, continues to support your industry, because to me, it is about jobs, it's about business, it's about bringing people together, especially as we've gone through a horrendous couple of years with COVID. And what we've seen with Interactive Games is the role you play in bringing people together. And quite frankly, if people can't see the importance of, of your industry, well, I've invented a new word for them, and they're called denoobs. They're dumb noobs. And we need to educate these denoobs as to what your industry has been doing for Australia over the past few years and what you can continue to do for Australia. So thank you for everything you've done and uh, good luck. Toodaloo. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm so pleased that you've joined us this morning and I'm delighted to bring you Digital Australia 2022 Connected by Games. As Ron said, this is the ninth uh, in a series of studies uh, that look at how Australians play video games, looks at who plays them, uh, sets out an opportunity for conversations uh, and gives us a basis with which to understand this amazing medium at an amazing time. I just want to uh, thank um, David Parkin for his acknowledgement of country and, and sort of outlining the research. Tim Watts, whose uh, father was uh, 
uh, a vice chancellor of this university, uh, amazing summary of his experience with games during the pandemic, uh, and uh, James McGraw, uh, a, great, uh, a great sort of summary of the opportunity that we have in developing our digital economy. So I'm delighted to bring you Digital Australia 2022. And I just want to shout out, because I can see names on the list, a hello to my very good friend, Helen Stuckey. Uh, I really wish we could be together uh, in the same room, all of us today. Uh, but uh, alas, uh, here we are taking advantage of uh, the amazing digital capabilities that we have. Let me um, start by explaining our theme. This quote, uh, I think does so much to help us understand where we have been over the past 19 months. As we were spending more time at home and new games were being released during the pandemic, exciting new games to play and fill those spare times. We couldn't interact with people in real life, so we communicated with friends and strangers through online gaming. Now, we have provided in this report a very large number of quotes, and I'll come back to this in a moment, but we've given participants in the research this year more opportunity to tell us about their experiences with video games during the pandemic. And wow, did they have a lot to say. I think you, if you've seen past uh, you know, summaries of this research, you know that we provide participants with an opportunity to communicate uh, in their own words, their experience, and you also know that over the years, uh, our participants have become more and more vocal and more detailed in their responses. You'll see that uh, today as we really marry a lot of stories with, of course, a lot of numbers. But for us, Connected by Games is a story about video games being perfectly placed at a very difficult time in our history. Before I go any further, I need to call out the key people who make Digital Australia possible. You would be looking at a boring Word document with much more text uh, than anyone would want to read uh, and very basic Excel graphs if it weren't for Dr. Jan Jarvis, uh, a recently minted PhD uh, from Bond University who has, uh, as you all know, uh, if you've been in past uh, launches, has been uh, very careful and very thoughtful and uh, very creative in bringing you uh, amazing information uh, at a very high level of graphic detail. So my great thanks to Dr. Jan Jarvis for her work on this report. We all know, and Ron would remind us, uh, that if it weren't for Raylene Knowles, uh, you wouldn't be reading this report. You wouldn't be here uh, at this uh, launch today because Raylene really is the executive producer and uh, the key whip uh, to make sure that we bring you this report every two years. So my sincere thanks and great admiration to Raylene Knowles. And uh, Mike Morfitt is an extraordinary graphic designer. Those of you who have worked with Mike know of his capability and his love of this industry. Um, his design this year, which is effectively a reimagination of the creation uh, uh, scene, but now in um, vector and ray tracing uh, designs is just stunning. And of course, we're using it to great effect as we launch the report this year. It gives us a great uh, basis with which to bring you what is otherwise very plain numbers in very rich detail. So before we go further too, I just need to remind everybody about the, I guess the, 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 you know, the, the methodological quality of this research. So we use Nielsen Research's Your Voice panel. This is a panel of 80,000 Australian homes. It is an amazingly rich and powerful and high quality panel. We ask Nielsen to give us national representation on age, gender diversity and identity, um, state and territory populations. And they do that every time we run the study with absolute perfection. This research represents 1,204 households and over 3,100 individuals in those households. The margin of error at worst for the household level data that we're reporting is plus or minus 2.7%. As the 
Uh, proportions get more extreme, so up into the 70s and 80s, that number for those of you uh, who enjoy a little bit of probabilistic statistics uh, know that uh, that number shrinks quite considerably. The, the worst case scenario for the margin of error uh, where we have a 50-50 split uh, for uh, all players is 2.5%, plus or minus. So a really uh, robust source of data on which to make conclusions about being connected by games. And every year uh, that we do the research, we subdivide the key theme into sub-themes. And this year, our sub-themes are connecting to games, which is about households. Uh, connecting with games is about individuals and the number of people who play. Connecting through games is focused this year specifically on pandemic-related connection opportunities that games give us. And then uh, connecting games with families is the usual sort of uh, research that we do into how families use games. And because these numbers haven't changed dramatically and we have covered them previously, uh, we won't dwell on them today. Remember that you can download this report uh, from the IGEA website and the videos that we're going to show are on IGEA's YouTube channel. Other themes include connecting games and culture and connecting games and personal growth. Finally, connecting games and the economy. So let's get into it and start with this quote. So this is a mother, 39 years old, household of four in Sydney. I've played more games since COVID started. We bought a Nintendo Switch and I play games with my kids as well. I didn't think I would enjoy it, but I do. And time and again, we see uh, that Australian households over time are discovering video games and finding increasing utility for them. 92% of Australian households have at least one device for playing video games. This year, we decided to uh, show you what that means in numbers. We have 9.5 million households in Australia, according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics. 8.6 million of them have a device for playing video games. This is up from 76% when we first started this research. Uh, so back then, there were approximately 7.7 .7 million households. Uh, so we've actually grown the number of households that have access to video games more than we've grown households in Australia. Indeed, by 3 million households overall. Quite an astounding uh, experience in the growth of a medium, which we're going to talk more about today. Most households have more than one device for playing video games. This has consolidated over the past few years, uh, and so 36% have one device, um, but what this means is that 5.5 million households have more than one device. And I really like this 24-year-old parent in a household of two in Hobart. I got very active in online gaming during the first COVID lockdown in March 2020. Before that, I'd never played on Discord using a voice call uh, in games with strangers. But I started craving social interaction so much that I got over my fear of voice calling with strangers while gaming. What an incredible personal story. And let me remind you, we collected these data in March 2021, so in March this year. And so a lot of the references to the pandemic are prior to the two most recent and horrific lockdowns uh, in Sydney and Melbourne. So what kinds of devices do Australian households have for playing video games? Well, as you would expect, and we heard uh, uh, Tim Watts talk about uh, the, um, you know, the PS5, for example, and waiting for consoles to drop, there has been a growth in the use of consoles during the pandemic, partly because of the pandemic, I believe, and partly because, of course, this console cycle refresh. Uh, and we see this growth every time there's a refresh um, when we do this research. But what's really interesting to me is that mobiles have dropped a bit, but married with tablets, uh, mobiles and tablets account for nearly as many people uh, using those devices as using consoles. Uh, between the two of them, mobiles and tablets equate to 66%. This year, we added uh, game subscription services to the mix, and 48% of our participants in game households said that they have uh, access to a game subscription service that they use. So this is one of the big stories this year, and I really want all of you to reflect on what this means. Video games now rank second 
among all media as a preference, as a go-to, as a source of entertainment and probably uh, relief during the pandemic. This is the first time games have been in the top five when we've asked this question, let alone the top three, let alone the top two. The only medium that Australians say they want to go to during the pandemic to help them through the pandemic is streaming TV and movies. Games have outpaced free-to-air TV, um, YouTube is fourth, and listening to music fifth. So we have said for many years that we believe video games are a mainstream medium. But it turns out that as time has gone on, they've sort of hovered in that middle section among uh, all media when it comes to choice. During the pandemic, video games have proven their value. Video games are now well and truly a dominant medium. So I like this quote uh, from a 22-year-old parent in a household of five in regional Queensland. I play because my partner plays and wants me to be able to play with him. It's a way for us to connect and have time to ourselves. So let's talk about connecting with games and who plays. Have a look at this video produced by Raylene Knowles that gives us a real sense of the place of games when it comes to connecting. I have an Xbox and a PS4 and pre-COVID I played that mostly on a Friday night for a couple of hours. Um, it was my sort of end of week stress relief if you like but as uh, COVID um, hit and lockdowns hit it definitely increased my hours so definitely much more game playing during COVID. There has to be some winner in COVID and I think you know, one of the winners in COVID is games, where people have seen that um, the communication and mental health aspects of playing games during COVID is, has been great, where kids that otherwise uh, maybe can't communicate, they can communicate playing a game. They can communicate through their actions. Um, they can also obviously communicate through voice. Um, but it also builds that camaraderie and teamwork. So many games are, require people to work together. Um, so I think we've seen a shift. I played more online games, more specifically games that involved other people, like multiplayer games. Uh, my friend Damo kept talking about this cooperative game he was playing and how much fun he was having. Um, and so eventually I decided I should try it. And I spent many, many hours playing with him and other members of the community group that he, or cooperative group that he was playing with. Um, and yeah, spent many more hours playing uh, games online than I had been previously. I think also people are using it as a kind of an emotional connection to other people. Uh, trying to stay safe and trying to do their part, but also finding fun ways to do that, which has been really great to see. Animal Crossing is a perfect example. My family did, my, I have a, my younger sister, she's living in London, she's living in London at the moment, still there. Unfortunately, like she's kind of stuck there, but um, no, because everyone was home, even my, I've got two daughters, young daughters, and we were all playing Animal Crossing, you know, together, and my wife, so we got four characters all there, but then we'd also, you know, late at, you know, late at night, we'd, we'd get on my, and my sister would, would jump on, and, and so we'd actually just go, we'd just be playing, and there's like, visit her island, she'd visit our island, um, and we'd just have like WhatsApp open, just doing, you know, for, for, you know, communicating and talking to each other that way. Um, and it was, you know, that was really nice. And it does make you, you think, you know, well, why don't, you know, why didn't we do that more before? And it's like, it's because everyone was so busy. Like, you know, everyone is busy. Everyone has their lives and needs to carry on. So what, what that's done, you know, the pandemic, you know, you're saying, what are the, what are the positives that came out of it from a, from a life choice or from a lifestyle point of view that one of the positives, I think, you know, I can see that families, you know, did get closer together that way. And, um, some, some families that was good, <laughs> some families that might not have been so good. So I really love Ben's story there. And, um, you know, I'm reflecting on the many conversations I've had over the past 20 years about the place of video games in Australian society. And we've reached a point now when instead of saying uh, automatically uh, and stereotypically, 
uh, that games are only for kids and they divide families, we see that games connect us uh, no matter where we are in the world through a common purpose and a common source of joy, even when uh, joy is elusive during uh, a global pandemic. So this year, we've looked at the diversity of people who play video games. We know that 17 million of Australia's nearly 26 million people play video games, 17 million. That's just over two thirds of the Australian population. I'm personally surprised it's not higher. Uh, it has grown uh, higher as a percentage of the population in some other jurisdictions. Uh, we've observed this year that um, uh, just as we have in previous years, the proportion of people who play is almost evenly mixed, male and female. And this year, uh, we also looked at non-binary gender identity, um, and we're pleased to be able to report that here today. For the first time in a couple of years, the average age of people who play video games has ticked up. If you were with us two years ago, you'll remember that we said it was moving up above the 34 years uh, of age um, bracket, um, but not over the halfway mark. This year, well and truly, the average age of people who play video games in Australia is um, 35 years of age. What's remarkable to me is that we were having conversations even uh, in federal government years ago uh, about whether or not gamers really are uh, adults. Well, we've got plenty of data around that, of course, but when we started the research using effectively the same methodology over time, the average age was 24 years. Uh, it is now 35 years, uh, and this is consistent with uh, data that we see coming out of other countries. Um, importantly, too, when we look at all players in Australia, this left-hand uh, hexagon on your screen, what we see is that 67% of all players are adults who are working age, that is to say 18 to 64 years of age. 11% are retirement age, 22% are children and adolescents, those between the ages of 1 and 17. 78% of one to 17 year olds play video games. Obviously that number is affected greatly by that youngest age group. 68% uh, are uh, 18 to 24 and 42% uh, of those people who are 65 to 94 play video games. So Jan has given us, I think, a really lovely summary here um, with these uh, clock diagrams and circles. The average amount of time the typical Australian plays video games is 83 minutes a day. Now, it's higher for males at 94 minutes and lower for females from the average, that's 70 minutes. And it's higher for children, 106 minutes on average every day. The typical casual gameplay is twice a day for 10 minutes a day. And the typical length of playing an in-depth game is for an hour or so. And that's, again, on a daily basis on average. The average time retirement age adults spend playing video games is 61 minutes. So there's a stereotype blower right there. An hour a day, people who are retired or retirement age are playing video games. Quite remarkable. And the average amount of time working age adults play is 82 minutes. So almost bang on the national average. So let's look at that in a little bit more detail and look at some of the, the surprises that we've seen in this year's data. The first thing to point out is that uh, we know that young males in particular are the heaviest players of video games. Indeed, the 15 to 24 year old bracket, and this is, by the way, the Australian Bureau of Statistics um, age bracket, uh, reaches a 128 minutes a day. So just over two hours uh, is the typical daily gameplay time for males in that age bracket. But look what happens at about 50 years of age. And we've shown this before. And the fact that we show this now repeatedly over time gives me great confidence that we're observing the reality in the Australian landscape. Women overtake men uh, as the most frequent and most heavy game players. So reaching about 80 minutes a day uh, between the ages of 55 and 64 and basically staying there and then ticking up again uh, between the ages of 75 and 84. Another thing to point out is that 
youngest, the youngest children, which I've joked in the past, kind of let the team down by not playing much. But of course, we know there are developmental reasons why uh, young, young children don't play video games. But this year, we've observed that the one to four-year-old males in particular are playing a lot more. I would put this down to the pandemic. I would put this down to children not being able to go to daycare. I would put this down to parents being overloaded as they try to serve as home educators and also primary caregivers and workers while looking after young children. Uh, we'll see in a little bit that parents, however, are managing and keeping an eye on their children's gameplay. Another thing to point out very quickly is this 85 to 94 year old group. This is a small group, um, but for the past two iterations of this study, we've seen that men uh, in their uh, 80s and early 90s uh, play video games too, and they're playing for about an hour a day. This is quite a remarkable story, and as somebody who has uh, an in-law, a parent-in-law in aged care, I can say the facility to interact through media generally and games specifically is a really positive facility for uh, cognitive uh, capability and dexterity, but we'll come back to that. So let's talk about connecting through games for a minute. And this quote uh, from a grandmother, 63 years old in Melbourne, obviously living uh, with her partner. She says, my two grandsons taught me how to play when I was caring for them during lockdown as their parents work in emergency services. Even though I'm not as good as them, they still want me to play video games when I'm at their house. So what a great way to acknowledge two things. One is a lot of people in Melbourne, among uh, other parts of Australia, but particularly Melbourne, uh, have done it really tough. And that frontline workers depend heavily on in-home care for their children. Here we have uh, a grandmother looking after children and using video games as a tool to connect with their uh, grandchildren. What a fantastic story. And also, what an empowering story when it comes to thinking about what do we do when the family routine is completely disrupted by a pandemic and lockdowns. And so let's focus just a little bit more on this particular question. We know, for example, that 76% of parents uh, played with their children either occasionally or often during the pandemic. Now, remember, we collected these data in March, 2021. Uh, so at that time, 70% of our participants said that they lived in a lockdown area uh, in the past year. Uh, and 42% were required to isolate, particularly in that early 2020 period. 36% said that they'll be playing video games more than before after the pandemic. 31% said they used games to help children during the pandemic. And again, the, the possibilities are almost endless, and we'll come back to some of those benefits in a little bit. 25% said they used games for virtual travel. Uh, I know personally that the capability of games to take us to different parts of the world is a, a very high capability. Um, and while it's not perfectly mimetic and doesn't uh, match in any way uh, the real world of travel, during a pandemic, video games aren't a bad second option. And 22% of our participants said that they communicated through games during the pandemic. So here's a 17-year-old in Melbourne saying, I played a lot of online multiplayer games with my friends during lockdown and over the course of 2020 in order to stay in touch with them when it wasn't possible otherwise and to relieve stress. So the stress relief capability of playing games during the pandemic shouldn't be understated. I believe that it's a major reason why many people have been playing games. And we'll come back to that. So the common playing experience far from the old stereotype of games being a lone activity, is that games are social. 75% of our participants said that they play video games either online or in the same room with others. Only 25% say that they only ever play video games alone. And here's the real story out of this particular set of numbers. 36% said they made new friends through video game play during the pandemic. 36%. Over a third of participants who play video games in our sample, and these are the adults talking about their own experience, let alone children, said that they made friends. 
What a remarkable power that video games have to connect us. Again, I believe we're connected by games. And so let's return to those reasons why people play. I said stress relief was uh, one major reason, and indeed it is the third major reason for video game play, at least in the past 19 months. Uh, but the number one reason, as always, is to have fun. Games are a beautiful entertainment medium. They give us so many different opportunities for so many different experiences. And there's a game for everyone. Whatever your cup of tea, whether it's an old board or card game ported to digital, or whether it's a fully immersive 3D world, there is something out there for you. The great story, of course, has been over the past couple of studies, we've been looking at the role of video games to keep the mind active. It creeps up a bit to second place, um, and that's across the board, but particularly, it is the leader for those 65 and older. Yes, they play to have fun, but it edges out ever so slightly that statistic for that age group. Uh, keeping the mind active is the primary reason they play video games. So there are lots of other reasons, of course, um, and uh, I encourage you to have a look at the report. Uh, I think the way Jan has rendered these uh, numbers is really informative, and I think a lot can be made out of these, um, these findings. I want to talk a little bit about uh, well-being games specifically. So this time we asked quite specifically, have you used a video game that you played specifically for well-being? And 32% said they used games for health and fitness. 81%, so four out of five, said they used games to help feel less stressed. And we heard when we, when we listened to Lynn and Ross and Ashley uh, and Haughty Chicken, uh, and Ben, uh, we heard stories about reducing stress levels during the pandemic. We also learned through this particular set of numbers that four out of five used video games specifically to help them feel mentally healthy. 24% played video games, uh, played mobile games, so on a mobile device, specifically for stress release in those moments when stressors were beginning to peak. Some other interesting numbers here, uh, almost four out of five used well-being games to help get motivated, almost 70% to increase physical activity with reminders and prompts, 68% to help them stick to uh, a fitness routine, 63% to connect with others for fitness. Uh, leaderboards and uh, competitions are absolutely empowering when it comes to staying well uh, and in the fitness game, certainly this is true. So these are among people who played uh, games for well-being. Now, I'm not going to read this quote uh, in detail, but this is a story of a mom who is working. Uh, she's got her children at home during the pandemic. She is the chief psychologist, the physiotherapist, the cook. Uh, she is doing it all and sounds like she's doing it tough. For me, the takeaway story from this very long and detailed uh, testimonial of the role of games for her and her family during the pandemic is profound. And so I, again, encourage you to get the report and look through the number of stories that are told. We can't cover them all here, uh, but they are remarkable stories of, uh, I guess, resilience and resistance uh, to um, the effects of the pandemic in our social lives. And we do play games socially, not only with one another, but in social spaces. So we asked this year, where are you playing games? Um, and again, the stereotype is often that lone teenager uh, in a bedroom with the door closed playing, uh, let's say, first person shooters. Well, in our story here, we see that the vast majority, two thirds of video game play takes place in social spaces, including in the kitchen, on public transport, outdoors, at work, uh, waiting for an appointment, and even at school between uh, sessions. 36% of our participants play in the lounge room, 11% are lucky enough to have a games room, and the remaining 30% 30, uh, 30 or so play in the bedroom. And when do they play? Well, the vast majority play from afternoon to evening, uh, and this is, of course, when the work day is done and when the school day is done and we have some opportunity for downtime. And what I'm really encouraged about when we uh, look at these numbers 
is that there is a distribution of times uh, that people prefer to play. So some people prefer late afternoon, some early evening, uh, some mid evening, and others mid afternoon, late evening with fewer uh, playing during the day. Let me talk just very quickly about uh, connecting games and families. As I said, I don't want to dwell on these numbers here. We know uh, from past iterations of this research uh, that the number one reason parents play video games with their children and their family is to connect the family. So again, our theme of uh, connected by games applies to connecting games and families. And I really like this 32 year old father in a household uh, of six in regional Queensland saying my gaming over the past year since the pandemic has been a useful tool. And this is a direct quote, I think to alleviate boredom, uh, entertain my children and to do something as a family that does not require us to leave the house. Again, the playground is open and the facility for downtime is readily available if you are one of those 64% of Australian households that have more than one device for playing video games. You have plenty of opportunity and games serve that purpose. Let me turn our attention to connecting games and personal growth. So we've talked about using video games specifically for well-being. So these are seeking games that are well-being focused. Let's talk more generally about the use of games off the shelf or downloaded general purpose entertainment games for connecting games and personal growth. So here we have a father, 40 years of age, household of six in Sydney. It was important for me to refresh my mind because I had to stay home and continue my office from my home. So I spent more time with my children and I played video games. So again, the opportunity to, I guess, ameliorate uh, the downsides of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, are there in video games. Let's have a look at some stories that bring this particular perspective to life in this video uh, produced by Raylene Mills. And again, I apologize for the frame rate. There should be some winner in COVID. And I think, you know, one of the winners in COVID is games where people have seen that um, the communication and mental health aspects of playing games during COVID is, has been great. Where kids that otherwise uh, maybe can't communicate, they can communicate playing a game. They can communicate through their actions. Um, they can also obviously communicate through voice. Um, but it also builds that camaraderie and teamwork. So many games are, require people to work together. Um, so I think we've seen a shift. They help me with my mental wellness. They make me feel happy. They can make me feel calm when other things do not. They help me feel connected when I feel isolated. They make me feel like I'm completing something. I enjoy them because of the variety that I play. They are part of my entertainment. They are part of my day. I can sit on the couch, relax, enjoy some dinner while I'm playing or have a beer. Um, and my partner is there, my dog is there, and we're just having a great time. And if I get bored or I get tired and I want to eat, I just pass the controller and he just takes over. My video games help me, they basically just take my mind off things, plus I like the puzzles and also catching up with friends online. So I wanted to type in chat, but it would have paused the video um, and made it worse than it already is. Um, if you did have video playback problems, uh, please accept my apology. I'm getting a very good frame rate, obviously, on my machine, and my bandwidth, it says, is high, uh, so I'm not quite sure where the problem is, and I'm not clear that we had the problem yesterday. Um, in any case, uh, I just want to reiterate uh, what this video told us, and hopefully the audio was clear enough. Um, if we, you know, listen to, to Ross and Hotty Chicken and Ashley, Ben, and Mike, um, what they're saying, of course, is that they believe that video games serve a purpose well beyond simple entertainment, uh, that video games can be connected to well-being, uh, and that uh, for them, uh, they're an important part of their overall well-being. And we can put some numbers uh, to those conclusions. I love this quote, again, a Queensland quote, uh, from a male 28, uh, 38 years of age, don't know what to say, really. Uh, playing games helps all aspects of my life during this pandemic. It's helped my depression and boredom. I mean, it's an in-your-face, very clear statement 
about the facility of video games to help us feel better at a time when we may not feel as good as we want to feel. And what I think about the numbers that I'm showing you now is that no matter what question, uh, what aspect of living well, we ask participants about video games and their potential, we get very high a, a statement that they either uh, agree or strongly agree uh, that games have this potential for living well. So what are the potentials? Growing general knowledge, mental health, number two, uh, digital knowledge, specialist knowledge, cultural knowledge, life satisfaction even at seven out of 10 participants. So a very high level of agreement that video games have a great potential for living well. And what about specific health benefits? Everything from uh, cognitive uh, elasticity and complexity right through to managing pains, our participants believe that video games have incredible capability at a very high level uh, to produce uh, benefits uh, in the community. And I think emotional well being and reducing anxiety, number two and number three in this uh, uh, list, tells us something about the place of games during the pandemic. What's really important to recognize here, too, is the you know, the wisdom of the crowd, James Sirowicki's notion that uh, if you ask a lot of people, and the vast majority of them uh, say that video games uh, are a powerful tool for improving emotional well-being, then probably it is true. We may not have clinical evidence of this here in this research. Other people have provided that evidence. Uh, but here we see uh, that Australians believe that games have this potential at a very high level. Um, I want to talk about games for aging well, and in particular, uh, put a finer point perhaps than I have on this uh, in previous um, iterations of our research. Here we see again a very high level of agreement by our uh, adult participants in this research who say that games have potential for improving aging. But the top three reasons our participants give this year for the ways in which a games could improve aging, improving balance, increasing mental stimulation, and fighting de uh, dementia are the top three reason the aged care sector and the health community say that aged care costs so much. If we could reduce falls, if we could increase mental stimulation and neuroplasticity, if we can help fight dementia, we can actually do a lot to reduce the overall, not only uh, economic costs, but social and emotional costs of aging. And so I am really encouraged by uh, these findings uh, that either uh, four out of five or nine out of 10 say that games can fight dementia, increase mental stimulation, improve balance. And of course, um, at the lowest level, reducing arthritis is a really interesting question. We know that joint mobility is an important part of treatment for arthritis. Uh, so perhaps, uh, particularly those games that allow us to move about more uh, could be very useful uh, going forward to fight um, some of the ravages of aging. Let's look at using games at school. 60% uh, of parents said that during the pandemic, uh, they were aware that their children were using games as part of the curriculum for their learning. I think there has been no better time to test the hypothesis that video games can serve a very powerful uh, purpose and can be a, an enormous tool in helping children learn. I've contended for years uh, that video games would make a suitable replacement for textbooks uh, where uh, students uh, who have many different types of learning capabilities uh, could tap into the power of games to learn. 60% of parents say that during the pandemic, their children uh, used games as a part of the curriculum in schools. 36% of parents said that their, game, their children are learning about programming or developing uh, games in school. And 36% say that they're engaged in some sort of co-curricular activity. And again, a lot of this will be online uh, during lockdowns. So quite encouraging uh, in terms of um, the role of games in school. And if you haven't seen it yet, have a look at this quote. Back when I was a kid, I never made any friends due to trauma in my life and bad social skills. I started playing a video game called Persona 3, which deals with themes of depression, death, and friendship. 
which helped encourage me to come out of my shell and talk to people. You know, you, you just, the, the stories that people have about the place of video games in their lives uh, tells me that we've been on the right track for a very long time in celebrating games as a powerful and transformational medium, a medium that has far more benefit than potential harm in our community, not negating the fact that there are conversations that we need to have about some of the downsides of games. The large story here is that there are many more upsides. And a quote like this, a story like this, a statement from our participants, uh, I think is rich and powerful. And um, I'll just call out uh, Jan here again. Jan went through all of the statements uh, that our participants gave and um, chose these stories that really match the sub-themes and helped us indeed develop the sub-themes uh, for this research. Let's look at um, using games at work. Uh, we know that 23% of Australian adults uh, have used games uh, to learn health and safety. 22% new knowledge. About the same number, workplace rules. Slightly less new software and tool, uh, or, or to use a new tool. And 19% to develop new skills. I know at my own university, we do a couple of things related to both learning and of course work productivity that, that are powerful. One is that we use the gamification capability uh, that's built into Grammarly. All of our students here get a funded license from the university to use Grammarly in all of their uh, assignment work. Staff use it as well. Um, it is a way to augment and improve uh, the capability that we have to communicate with one another, and it's a gamified solution. I'm also working with a, uh, a vet sector provider who's using both games and virtual reality uh, to help adults learn about safety, particularly um, in agricultural uh, health and um, mining sectors. So we know that games are serving this purpose and they're a much better place to make mistakes than in real life where safety is a main concern. So let's talk now about connecting games and culture. And we know that a lot of opportunity exists, uh, not only by playing games, but also playing with other people uh, and enjoying the broader culture of the storytelling and the mechanics in games. And I like this, uh, this quote uh, from a 24-year-old living alone in Brisbane. Uh, games help me escape from the bad times into my own world, as well as express my creativity through making fan characters, art, and so on. And so here what we're talking about is how people engage with game culture. And this first uh, graph that we're showing you is really about uh, receiving game culture. 68%, so more than two thirds of our participants who play video games and are adult, uh, read or watch walkthroughs. The second most popular at 56% is watching YouTubes of gameplay. 46% say they've watched live streams of games. Now we've also asked about uh, things like watching esports online and attending an esports event in person. When we ask these questions, we ask the question ever, not just during the lockdown, but ever, because we're aware that for some of these game culture activities, uh, for example, going to a major event like PAX just isn't possible during a pandemic. So we decided to open up this question and really specify at any period of time uh, in the past. Um, so, we also asked about attending an in-game event or concert, so engaging in the metaverse. And what we found uh, was that the vast majority of people who uh, say that they enjoy game culture, yes, they read walkthroughs, but as many as over a third have engaged in in-game event. So that's really quite remarkable. And let's drill down very quickly on esports. Uh, in terms of those watching esports, why do they watch esports or attend esports in person? The number one reason is that they enjoy taking part in player culture. The second reason is to learn strategies to improve their own gameplay. And the third is enjoy watching competitions, 6%. Uh, so not a small amount when we think about how young esports is, enjoy following a specific esports esports team. Quite amazing. These are adult players who follow or attend esports. How about those who specifically attend esports? Well, 42% do so because they enjoy the player community 
similar number just enjoys the social aspects of esports generally. So these dominate compared with enjoying the challenge of competing in esports or to become a better player by watching esports. We know that a, a wide range of people, a vast array of Australians play video games from all walks of life. And more and more, as we recognize that games have greater diversity in their content, people want that diversity uh, and want to see themselves in games. So we asked again this year, as we did two years ago, where do you see the need for more diversity in games? 60% said they wanted to see either uh, more accessibility and inclusion or age representation in games. So uh, they were able to choose all that apply. Um, and in both of these instances, 60% said they wanted to see more representation of age ranges and accessibility and inclusion. A similar number wanted to see more cultural diversity. 48% wanted to see more LGBTQI a plus communities represented in games. And we know that those communities are not that well represented in games at the moment. So as we're making more games, uh, particularly here in Australia, what a great opportunity to uh, help many different Australians see themselves in the games that they play. Let's just wrap up by talking about games and the economy. Here is a 69-year-old uh, in regional New South Wales whose daughter is a lead animator in one of the largest MMORPG games in the world. And he says, my eldest granddaughter is starting her degree in animation this year. Australia needs much more emphasis on game development onshore instead of people having to move to America or elsewhere to gain employment. I think this man is lamenting the fact uh, that his daughter is living overseas. Bring them home, allow them to work from home, and produce games here. And how do Australians prefer to access games? Well, we said that 48% have subscription services, 36% prefer those services as a way to get games, but 67%, two thirds, still prefer to buy games uh, when released uh, from the store or online. In terms of the importance of the games industry for Australia, 95% say there's value in making games in Australia. 89% say that the Industry is very important to the economy uh, of Australia, and 70% believe the government should increase its incentivization of the games industry. And so those tax offsets uh, are a welcome uh, outcome in this regard. 20% um, say that they have some knowledge of programming. 16% say they're planning to learn games programming. We know there's a crunch on software engineering here in Australia, so it's great to see that young people are looking to um, build their skills in games development. Um, a number of people say they plan to work or are currently working in the games industry, 14%, and 12% plan to study or are studying currently uh, for a games industry or related industry um, in Australia. So I like this last quote, online gaming has, been, has become a social lifeline. This is a female in a household of five. Uh, she's a parent uh, in Melbourne. So I think this quote wraps up the theme of this research very nicely. We are connected by games, and I hope that you'll connect to this research by downloading the report and also viewing all of the videos that Raylene has produced on the IGEA YouTube channel. Thank you very much for attending the session, um, and I'm looking forward to your questions uh, because it's been an absolute delight to put this research together. Thank you, Jeff. I'll just pause there so you can hear everybody clapping and thanking you, at least virtually. Cheers. <laughs> Jeff, so, you know, we've gone through a lot of data points and I've, I've sat through a lot of these presentations over the last 16 years. So there's a whole bunch of data there. Did anything surprise you this year? Yeah, uh, two things. Um... Ron, and, and you know, uh, you're, you're quite right. We, we kind of do this research, don't we, thinking that we've seen it all or that we really know what's going on. I think by and large, we know that we are connected by games. Uh, I think the thing that really surprised me uh, was one, uh, that over two thirds made friends in games during the pandemic. Uh, what a profound statement. Uh, it's just incredible that we're able to have this conversation now to say that, Games are a place where people make friends just in the same way we make, make friends at parties, um, at pubs and clubs, uh, on sporting pitches, 
um, and um, in school. So I think, or, or work. So it's it's really exciting to me to see friendships uh, blossom through games. The other thing that really, really surprised me is that games are now well and truly a dominant medium. You can't argue it when they're number two among all those media that we provided our participants to comment on and rank um, is really powerful. And so we can't, I think, uh, we really have to be careful not to understate uh, what this means. Games have beat out free to air television this time uh, as a medium of choice, uh, particularly when the chips are down during a pandemic and we need to find something to do uh, to feel satisfied um, in our daily lives. That's encouraging. It is. And look, I'm probably, you know, two, two thirds of the people have said that they've, um, you know, made friends or met new people. And yet we're told the, you know, the internet is an evil place and we've got to be careful with scammers and, you know, we, you know, be super yeah. cautious. A game is a safer place, do you think? Or what, what's the difference? Or is there a difference? I don't see any media reports of uh, entire populations being manipulated uh, against political candidates. Uh, or against vaccination in video games. So I'll start there. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think they're a perfect haven, of course, and, and we know that, and, and parents know that. And one of the main uh, focuses of parents is to, uh, when we ask them, you know, so sort of what kinds of rules do you have in your house? And again, we didn't cover it here, but it's in the report. Um, what, what kinds of rules do you have in your home about video game play? Whether or not they play online ranks in the top five. So we know that parents are onto it. Um, but, but I want to come back to uh, the core of your question, and that is, um, you know, the internet can be a bad place. I can't imagine what it would have been like if this pandemic hit uh, 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. Could you imagine uh, the 1980s and the computers and the internet we had then and how we would have managed through this pandemic? I think almost everyone participating in this webinar today works in a job that allows them to work from home. So we're the lucky ones. And we're lucky because frame rates and video playback uh, aside, if we didn't have uh, the bandwidth that we have now, uh, to the extent that we have it, um, we would be in a, in a very difficult place. And I remember, and I know you remember, Ron, um, you know, an attorney general sort of saying the internet um, is, is maybe isn't a fad. And why do we need broadband? It's ridiculous. Uh, people just want to watch porn. Uh, you know, it couldn't be further from the, uh, the truth that, that people are, you know, are, are using the internet for only nefarious purposes. We know that the internet is a huge facilitator for well-being and productivity uh, in Australia, and we should recognize that. Uh, Nathaniel had a question. Um, is, is it your expectation that the higher gaming adoption rates associated with lockdown will be maintained as lockdown eases, or will the new adopters simply go back to their old pastimes? I haven't met, thanks for that, Nathaniel. Great question. I've never met a person who picked up uh, a, a mobile phone or a tablet or started on a, a game on a console or the PC who has looked back, who hasn't found the value, the gratification, um, and the potential uses uh, for video games for their lives. I don't think anyone disadopts games once they start. It's kind of like saying, once you've watched television, do you never watch television again? You may not watch as much. You may not play as much as you're playing during the pandemic, um, but you continue to play. And I do believe that when we, uh, and opening up isn't going to be flicking a switch, right? Uh, it's going to be a gradual process. I was reading uh, this morning in media about some of the thinking here nationally um, as we open up our borders, but it will be a gradual process. And as we find new opportunities to go back outdoors, to travel, I think games will throttle back a little bit, but I do believe that once we've got it out of our system, we're going to play games uh, at the same rate or more uh, because we're going to find more opportunities for them. And I think games will also be adapted to, uh, I mean, the market will, will dictate this, of course, but I think there will be great opportunities to take games into the real world uh, environment, bring back a social interaction that's physical and also supported by games. And I, you know, here I think about um, augmented reality games being a, a real option going into the future. Cool. Um, and I hope I pronounce 
uh, the following name correct. It's Taylor, I think, and apologies if I don't get that right. So it's a fantastic presentation. Uh, and uh, Taylor was surprised to see that VR are such a small percentage of types of devices in usage given the social immersion and connection it provides. Uh, why yep. don't you think it represents a larger audience? Yeah, I agree with that, Taylor. And I, I think that um, uh, I was surprised uh, by that. Um, it's down a little bit from the previous iteration of the research. And I wonder if um, part of this uh, represents, you know, the, uh, first of all, uh, adopting new consoles without um, peripherals, just getting those consoles into the home uh, and uh, bedding them down and, and getting, you know, the games that people want to play on them. Um, I think there's a, probably a, a problem, um, and Ron's going to crack a smile here, but some of us have a problem with our proprioceptive sense where we get dizzy um, and, and motion sick and so on, and, and putting head-mounted displays in particular on uh, can be a problem. Um, so I think that might be a reason. Uh, I know a number of people who have tried VR and decided not to adopt. Um, I, I agree with you that um, augmented reality ought to be more of a thing and it's built into um, our handsets now as a capability. Um, and I think that's really where it will go. And I suspect some of our participants weren't identifying that as well because we asked the question quite generally about um, virtual and augmented reality. And I think maybe um, we should drill down a little bit and ask a few more questions uh, to see if we um, can better capture some of those numbers. Now, I'm going to predicate the next question uh, with the statement that says that I'm currently tethered to 5G because my MBN isn't uh, stable mm. enough to host this meeting today. But has the completion of the MBN network been an important factor in the growth of the digital economy and, and gaming in more, more specifically? Yeah, I love this question. So, so we, have, um, we have a new program on digital transformation here. Uh, we recognise that one of the... Um, you know, emerging technologies, not only for connectivity speed and low latency, but also for the internet of things is 5G. Ironically, um, 5G is absolutely brilliant in that regard. Um, but of course, a hardwired um, ethernet connection and uh, something to either ADSL2, or in my case, I'm very lucky to have cable internet uh, is just amazing. Um, we would not have I mean, I'll go back to my statement. I can't imagine uh, this pandemic having happened uh, even 10 years ago. Uh, I think if you wanted to pick a time, um, now is about as good as any, um, not that any time is good for a pandemic, but because of our capability, um, I think the NBN has made a difference. Um, and I think we've undernourished it. Uh, and um, I know a lot of my regional friends and family um, certainly see that. So, uh, if we didn't have um, our broadband capability we have now, a lot of what's happened over the past 19 months would not have been possible and our economy would have been crippled. I believe that wholeheartedly. With games, uh, well, when you're locked down and you can't go to a store, uh, how else do you get your game if you don't download it or, or subscribe to subscription services? And indeed, I think the growth of subscription services over the past uh, couple of years has probably been profound. We didn't measure it two years ago, um, I'll defer to Ron and, and um, you know, IGEA members for that, but I believe from uh, anecdotal uh, evidence that subscription services have really ticked up during the pandemic. So again, without, without our uh, infrastructure, we would have been in trouble. Right. Um, do you see esports ever breaking through into mainstream Australia, given the demographics of the gamers is 35 or is it just too niche or are we too small? I think it's just too early. Um, I mean, the great question about esports. Um, I mean, esports um, has suffered during the pandemic, and so has um, we. We even see a little bit of a sort of a knockback in a couple of the numbers compared to two years ago when we asked some questions around this. Um, we have our own esports team here at Bond University, and um, they have struggled during the pandemic because they can't go to comps, they can't be physically present. Uh, there's a huge. Uh, you know, advertising supported sponsorship model, uh, just as there is with mainstream sport. And it's really hard to support that. Um, I just think it's too early. Uh, and I think the pandemic uh, has slowed growth. I don't think that um, esports will reach the fervor that it reached in South Korea, for example, um, here in Australia, um, because we do have this amazing natural amenity 
um, you know, arguably one of the most beautiful countries in the world for outdoor living. Uh, and as a result, I think um, outdoor sports, physical sports uh, will continue to be important to us. But I, as I said earlier, uh, and, and this one's, uh, I'll add to it for Ron, uh, I can see an opportunity where our big stadia are filled with uh, football players, soccer players who um, are playing while we also wear or use our handsets for augmented reality to augment aspects of the game and even to have our phantom leagues, for example, playing alongside players on the field could be quite interesting um, mm -hmm. and a really interesting model. And I think that's where esports. Uh, could also go where there's a little bit more um, visibility um, connected with um, mainstream sports. Right. So next question, Jeff, uh, I'll, I'll flick to you, but I'm happy to pick it up as well. So what do you think the federal government is, sorry, do you think the federal government is taking gaming as seriously as it should? And what else could they be doing to help bring big developers to Australia? Yeah, well, I'm glad you're flicking to me, Ron, because I can say this, um, I mean, obviously, we've known each other for many years, and uh, you know I, I wholeheartedly uh, value and support what IGEA does, but if it weren't for IGEA, um, I don't think the federal government would be aware uh, of, of the games industry, quite frankly. Um, and I think the work that we've done uh, with this research over the years has helped sensitize uh, more and more people to the um, potential in the economy. As we move more and more to a digital economy, uh, games contribute so much. And again, I think Senator McGraw and, and the Honorable Tim Watts um, said it beautifully when they said that uh, you have to be crazy not to recognize the value of um, making games here uh, for the economy. And so I think the government is growing in its um, awareness. Yes, it needs to do more. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and just for the, and unfortunately it's come up as anonymous attendees, so I can't address you by name, but the government did announce the digital games tax offset, which will come in effect on July 1, 2022. And they put a lot of effort behind attracting large studios to Australian big developers. Uh, Austrade are right behind it. There's a business talent attraction task force that's behind it. We're working very closely with IGEA, there's overseas missions being going on. So certainly a lot of work is being done in the lead up to the, the launch of the DGTO to attract big developers, but there's still other work to be done around how do we support the independent sector in Australia. So we end up with a nice, wholesome, well-supported um, ecosystem where every, every part of it is ticking along nicely. So the government could be doing more, but they certainly are taking it seriously now. And that's both the government and the opposition. We know the opposition have always taken it seriously, but the government's come along and you're right, Jeff, it's through research like this where we've normalised gaming um, you know, and, and take, you know, the parliamentary friends of video games, I think is the perfect example of that, where we now have a club in Parliament House, which is great. Um, Probably jump to one last question. Um, do you see time where we will see gamification as a standard in early education and the curriculum being supported by the state government education bodies? Yeah, thank you for that question. Who's that from, Ron? Can you say uh, again, unfortunately, it's from anonymous. Okay. No, look, thanks for the question. It's it's actually one of my favorite topics. So be careful. How much time do we have? Uh, I promise, Ron, I'll be short. Um, look, I I think that the Australian curriculum lends itself perfectly. Uh, to gamification and games-based learning. Um, as I said, 60% of parents say they're aware that games are being used um, for their children's learning presently. Um, but I, I do lament that if you read through the Australian curriculum, and I, a few years ago, uh, gave a um, keynote in Sydney to a uh, educational uh, publishing company's conference, um, or publisher's conference, I should say. And um, the, I gamified it. Um, I divided the audience into four parts and gave away gifts and put it all in Prezi. And it, it was a lot of fun, um, if a bit messy. Um, and I pointed out that if you look through the Australian curriculum, you will not find mention of video games per se, except for in a little media studies uh, packet in, I think, year 10. That, that's it. Um, I mean, it, it's really pathetic that we're not recognizing the place of games in society within the curriculum. And then of course, there's nothing in the curriculum about gamifying it or structuring it that way. And yet it has levels, it has um, micro levels, it has um, uh, you know, basically different kinds of rewards built into it. 
We just don't acknowledge it. And then we don't build it out as a gamified solution. But in fact, the fact, the fact that we have um, these 13 levels in the Australian uh, curriculum is incredible. It's, a, it's you know, updated every few years. So it would be great to see gamification really make its mark uh, in the Australian curriculum. I think we're not getting close to that, unfortunately. I think educators are very often um, late adopters in this way. Um, I think that's changed with respect to games, but I think the policymakers in education uh, are, are lagging behind. Right, and, and that uh, question was from Andrew. So he just uh, just popped up saying it was from him. Yeah, good on you, Andrew, thank was, you. I know I said that was the last one, uh, but another one that's dear to your heart, I'm gonna to have to ask you, Jeff, is do you see a future where nursing homes are routinely equipped with gaming devices? <laughs> I see it now. Um, it's, it's really happening, I mean, routinely, Maybe not, but you know, uh, I love the fact, and 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 it really supports, um, you know, my hope uh, that if uh, ever I am um, in the position where I need um, assisted living, uh, I can play video games. Please, please make that happen because um, actually, right now I don't get to play enough, as you know, Ron. Um, and I'm I often talk about retirement as being my gaming golden years, um, but but I am really uplifted when I see that hospitals use games, and they do now quite routinely, uh, for palliative care. Uh, I, I love that they use it for pain relief. I love that um, aged care facilities are taking into account uh, the uh, ability of video games and dance mats and so on to help improve uh, balance uh, as we age. And balance is, is a killer, and it's a high cost um, source of um, trauma for older citizens. So yes, it's close to my heart, maybe because I'm aging, uh, but also because I actually believe video games are perfectly suited for improving aging. Excellent. I think that's a, a great um, spot to finish. Um, there was a question about, can we download the report? Yes, you can download the report. Um, Molly is going to drop the link in the chat now, but it's also on the IG website, which is igart.net. And it's right on the landing page. So as soon as you get there, you can download the whole report and look at the summaries. Jeff, thank you again for today. Thank you for the research. It's always great to, uh, to finally get it on the screen and, and do the presentation. So we really appreciate that. Yeah, thank you, Ron. Um, and thanks to IGEA, by the way, and the board. I really appreciate the opportunity to continue to do this research. Yeah, thanks. And that was my next thank you was to our board and to our members who continue to, to see the importance of this research and, and supporting it and funding it, you know, year after year and putting faith in it in the team. Uh, thank you, Molly, who's uh, working away in the background here, making sure just everything is seamless, that Jeff and I are on time, that when I say the link's going to be there, all of a sudden it's there. Um, so thanks. Yeah. Thanks greatly, uh, Molly. And thank you, everyone, for, for participating, for coming along and, and giving up your time. Um, to learn more and hear more about um, how games are connecting people. We're happy to continue the conversation. Please reach out to uh, any of the IGEA team. You can do that via the website. I'm available at ron at igea.net. We're happy to connect you with Jeff if you need to be. So thank you very much. Uh, enjoy the rest of your morning. Carry out. <laughs>